De Brassant, it's a it's it's a pleasure, a pleasure and a privilege to see you as ever. And uh delighted to see that as far as I can tell, you're in your office. Is this um have you been there long? Have you ever left it? Uh, well I have to pop in to water the plants and check everything's working and um it's really amazing having the place to yourself. It takes you back to the core of what your original mission was, having started as a solo practitioner. Well, I was going to say, how many people would normally be around you there? Oh, 45 to 50. OK. So it makes you, lonely. Yes, it makes you realise how noisy workspaces are for a start. Um, but I, you definitely miss the social energy of the place and the collaboration that goes on, you know, and the, just the sense of creativity. It just feels like a building rather than a studio at the moment. Well, we've been asking a number of architects uh, um, about what it's like working under these conditions. But as we're here to talk about how we might be operating generally in 2025, and this is to do with uh, the uh, competition with the RIBA where uh, we're running, we think 2025, where we're looking ahead to, well, it's five years ahead because uh, effectively the idea is that obviously there are quick fixes and temporary solutions one can do as one comes out of lockdown. But five years, it would be a time to, for permanent changes or if they were to be required in the built environment to start to be implemented. So that's what we're asking people to think about in the competition. And I guess it's what we're going to be talking about today because um, I suppose my first question is, here you are in your office working, nobody around you, but presumably your um, colleagues are all working from home or as many as uh, as can be sustained at this, at this moment is that how it's working i'd say uh, many of them are working at home and several are working in the garden definitely yes the call of the outdoors and the connection with nature seems to be really really strong um, we've had people taking meetings in the park since parks opened uh, i think that whole blurring of the boundaries has definitely been uh, in evidence and i think that's going to continue well that's uh, what i was going to ask i mean to what extent is our, our ways of working that we're all doing now and here we are producing a magazine all from our various homes and it's perfectly possible um how much that do you reckon is going to continue in uh, in the future once you know one assumes there will be a time when a kind of normality is resumed well i think this sort of shift in ecology that's gone on that i think people understand their relationship with nature and the bigger planet much more than they did four months ago I think the, the the interconnection between us is much more apparent. So I think we'll see that really drive through in the way that briefs are written and constructed and above all, how personal choices are made. I think uh, we noticed maybe in the last 10 years, more people getting to a certain age in their 30s and then leaving London to seek a life in the countryside, to be connected with nature, to have time for family. I think people now through the temporary uh, arrangement are sort of reconnecting with those kind of um, emotional and psychological synapses of society. So um, with that sort of glue, uh, I can imagine that's going to persist because I think that recalibration has been really, really helpful. Yeah, I mean, you are obviously in a very busy bit of town. You're on Vauxhall. It's a kind of sort of vortex of activity around there. Uh, and yet, obviously, that's not necessary to the running of the business. Uh, you said there that you know you think the briefs would change. I find that interesting. I just wondered how much of the change and what this change might be will will we'll come on to. Do you reckon it's going to be driven by the architects and how much is going to be driven by their clients? Well, I think it's an ideal time for architects to demonstrate agency and mm -hmm. as your competition is going to do, kind of show that there's new amalgams of programs and functions mm -hmm. And, and particularly new ways of using technology with architecture to program space. I think that's going to be the big shift. We're going to be in a much more uh, kind of timetabled lifestyle and, and apps over the last five, 10 years have really radically changed the way that we can use space. So um, from Airbnb sort of revolutionizing our understanding of how we might use empty home space to become a hotel, in effect. Mm. Uh, people now are using Airbnbs as temporary offices. I've heard, uh, you know, this this sort of fluidity of function is something that architects can demonstrate through research, you know, and they can come up with proposals and that will shift perceptions because uh, after all, we are 
in a unique position with our spatial intelligence as architects to demonstrate things spatially. Uh, so I don't think agents on their own or clients on their own, I think the collaboration is going to be there and, and, and shaping the brief is something that we really need to sort of spearhead. Now, well, in a sense, we've already discussed that because we are assuming change. But I mean, I suppose I ought to ask it straight out. I mean, what are the arguments against going back to business as usual, by which I mean everything as it was before in our world? Well, I mean, you're, yeah, I mean, the idea of things going back to normal, um, I think one can argue that there might be trends for sort of falling back into one's old ways. But I mean, just the sheer economics are going to shift tremendously uh, in terms of the amount of space people are going to want, uh, you know, the amount of travel people are wanting to do. So uh, and the values at the bottom of it all, there's just a reassessment of values. So first and foremost, there's going to be an assessment of economic values. But I think ethical values and public values have really shifted. The idea of public good, I mentioned it at a, at a talk the other day, and I got the most amazing reaction from a planner on the panel who was just like, yes, the thing that's happened through the last three or four months is an understanding of public good and infrastructure. So this idea of society sort of holding us together, allowing us lots of freedoms, my gosh, we certainly have them, uh, but equally, the balance of how much control can be applied to society is something that people are really thinking about. So I think we're we're not going to be going back to normal. We're probably mm. going to be tracked a lot more than mm. were previously. But then maybe we'll really enjoy that tracking. You know, when we come to things like mobility, uh, we're probably going to see the rise of mobility as a service. You know, that we're talking now about having to book ourselves onto trains, book spaces. Uh, when you're coming timed entry into 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 buildings, you're going to need technology to mediate between uh, human beings and spaces. And I think we're going to be sort of, you know, we're, we're going to be at the crux of that, because first and foremost, we're going to be managing the queuing that's going to happen. You know, well, we're going to be exactly. managing the kit. Yeah. Uh, but we are going to be thinking now, I think, more about the, the whole journey, uh, about what it's like to be in a space to move then through uh, public infrastructures, public facilities that are laid on the street, the, the, the transport, the healthcare, you know, the, the policing of spaces, we'll be much more keenly aware of that. And then as we go to our destinations, how we're uh, greeted and how we fi finally arrive. So I think that will shift the way that clients who commission and commissioners will look at the way that, you know, how they value spaces and the public. Are you you at uh, DSDHM, you work across the sectors, really. I mean, you do housing, you do, you do, you do commercial and so forth. Um, I mean, what building type do you reckon needs most attention in the coming years um, in response to what we've been through? Obviously, there's housing, there's um, health buildings. We've seen how they can respond. Um, transport, you've mentioned, of course. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of uh, building up, I think the home is definitely going to see improvements. Mm. Uh, you know, I've got people that I'm meeting online uh, from my studio who are in very small apartments above shops with ac no access to open space, taking photographs of their neighbours with their feet hanging out of the window, just trying to connect with nature. Yeah. Uh, what we're hearing already from planners uh, with whom we're consulting and we wholeheartedly agree uh, is that no longer will you be able to provide housing without access to amenity and outdoor space. You won't be able to kind of offset it for this reason and degrees of difficulty. So that's great. Obviously, workspace at home is going to be something that we've hoped for uh, and now will be more sort of firmly monitored. Uh, and, and then I think there's also, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek, but I mean, you're partaking it in yourself. It's the home as studio, the home mm. as as a broadcast entity is going to lead to different behaviours. And I, I remember being shocked once um, seeing a still from, uh, what was it, Keeping Up With The Cardassians, you know, these reality shows. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was one of the family members in their home and it was so huge. I said, well, that must be a studio, but it actually it was, an, it was a house that had been adjusted to accommodate its studio crew, et cetera, and the lighting. Okay. I think on a microcosm, you know, we're going to be setting our, our, you know, the kind of Instagram world of the public is going to come into the home now as we nurture it. I mean, you're you're doing the um, 
the the, the library as as backdrop. Mm. I, I, I'm just I'm just thinking that your models and plants beat my books easily. Actually, that's uh, you've no, got I'm, a much better background. I'm intimidated by the quantity of reading that you've got there. It's really impressive. I think I should do a screen grab, look, and then I can check what you've been reading and catch yeah, up. Yeah, please do. Yeah, there's, there's probably some embarrassing books on there. Now I think about it, embarrassing architecture books. There's a whole strand waiting for us there. But, but I yeah. suppose it's thing of it's it's uh whilst we've retreated to the home a lot more and we might be based there there's also a kind of public sharing of the home so I yeah that would be interesting but also there's the there's, there's, there's matter of density i mean is there going to be a you mentioned you know as people reaching a certain time of life disappearing from the countryside and so forth do you reckon there's going to be more of that in other words people are people seeking a more suburban existence um because i'm slightly worried that it might lead to just ever more greenfield low density development if we're not careful whereas high density but safe high density would be the thing to well, I think that the, the, the trump the trump card with density is active travel what's happening now is we're realizing that as we have to uh, reduce the quantum of people on public transport we're having sorry I'll start that again just <coughs> got something in my throat Ooh. um well, as I, um, yeah, I think the, the the trump card for the city is that whilst people are unable and unwilling, I suspect, to stay on public transport to the sort of crushed numbers that we've seen pre-COVID, that's going to mean that active travel is the favoured way to move, and it's also the the most blessed sort of low carbon solution. So, by so how, do you, how, how do you define well active travel, cycling, walking, and so forth? Yeah. That's right. So if you if you think of a society with cycling and walking, it's probably going to be easiest to achieve in in the city or in very, very well connected forms of suburbia. So you, you've always got the limitation that the that um, public transport and sort of the public transport can take you out to a location, but you're always then going to have to depend quite commonly on private vehicles. And whilst there have been test cases of whole towns developed with, uh, you know, fantastic walking and cycling infrastructure, I think people, particularly as they get older, will come to the city because they'll be able to walk to the hospital. You know, they'll be able to walk to the mm. doctors uh, or cycle. And I think that uh, contrary to what most people are saying is that we'll see a retreat to the kind of suburbanisation we saw after the war and that kind of modern, modern idiom of the centre of the city for working and the edge for living. Mm. I, I have a lot of faith that we will see in, we will carry on seeing density in the city and, and people wanting to be in the city, but it will be a much more humane way of do, doing things. You know, people will have apartment, uh, apartments will have uh, amenity, they will have decent green space. And I think you'll also find that there will be technological solutions to issues like getting into lifts and shared lobbies, etc. I think we, we, you know, we're seeing the return to normal in that respect in China. Uh, people are overcoming those uh, sort of smaller challenges. Uh, but here, I think, you know, we're really going to be sort of pushing that active travel agenda. Which brings us to the question of uh, you know, the public realm, the great outdoors. Now, obviously, in your practice, uh, you've done a lot of work in this, particularly in terms of managing people, actually. I think you've done work on, as it were, the absorbing of the crowds which are going to be generated by Crossrail, for instance, uh, in, over 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 wider areas and just the immediate vicinity of the station. So, th there's so there's already been thinking done on that and design done on that. But does that tell us something about? We've seen a lot about you know people really really working open space over the last uh, couple of months, haven't we? Do you think there's there's likely to be more of that? It's a very Victorian idea, really. Well, I think uh, what's going to happen is we're going to see much more timetabled out. Sorry, time, what we're going to see is much more timetabling of outdoor space mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to have to work harder. Yeah. It's going to be, you know, if you take the centre of the city uh, in the morning, it might have flows of people going to and from work. But in the evening, it can become a place to dine outside. I think people are going to want to increase their profitability in the uh, restaurant trade. So they'll be cl claiming the street like they're going to be doing in New York, and they've already started in New York a few years ago. Uh, you're going to find uh, school streets shutting, 
uh, between the, more schools shutting the roads immediately outside of them uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, and then you're going to have to have the management of queues because as we go into retail or into transport infrastructure, we'll have our temperature taken. There's going to be different sort of ebbs and flows. And so we're also, if you imagine that's the sort of day as we um, get used to this new sort of uh, new sort of pattern on the ground, that will shape things. So what we have to do over the next five years is put in very light infrastructures that can adjust because some new technological solutions or modes of transport might be coming along. So we don't want to see things too fixed at the moment. We want them to be tested and sort of tactical. So I imagine we're going to be seeing, and we are seeing some really great ideas emerging about how to use the public space and uh, to manage you know, these new flows on the ground. So finally, I guess, um, do you reckon that this thing's tend to take a long time but at some point this has got to sort of be enshrined into into the regulations by which I mean sort of I suppose uh, people separation uh, space standards so you can um, uh, work from home more easily things like this um, you know is it a matter for the regulators do you think to start to, to enshrine some of these thoughts such that it just becomes the norm well, it's extraordinary because we do work in the public realm. Um, we're doing um, collaborative research at the moment with uh, helping Urban Design London, for example, and some local authorities. They've had to produce emergency local legislation as well as there being uh, national legislation to deal with these temporary situations. Okay. So, for example, where I am at the moment in Lambeth, they've just issued a, a new emergency order, which means at any time they can close any street for any purpose. Uh, wow. So there's really some interesting uh, elasticity in legislation coming in because there's one thing about highways and the highway includes the footway, as we say, technically you have carriageway and footway. You know, public space is highly uh, legislated. And so now there's room for creativity. You've got politicians deeply interested, academics and practitioners. So as a, as a trio coming together, there's gonna be some really uh, good stuff set up in the public realm. I know in terms of building use, I think we can look to places like Finland who have trialled uh, to various degrees of success, lifetime policy making and testing. Uh, and I, maybe we'll see some of that here. You know, maybe there'll be something like a kind of exemplar programme where you might have a certain area where you're allowed to test, rather like we have in the dock, had in the Docklands or in special economic zones, mm -hmm. where you know, local authority demonstrates very good, uh, you know, custodianship of policy and can be trusted to try new ways of doing things. So I suspect we'll see a more liberal uh, approach to, especially hybridity. I think with retail crashing on the high streets, they're going to have to allow making to take place there more, going to allow working. So it will become, I think it will blur more with, uh, you know, the different uh, sort of work policies. So I, I'm hoping for more fluid fluidity. <laughs> I, I live in hope. Let's hope so. Well, let's, thanks very much, Deborah. Let's, uh, let, let, let's end it there. There's a sort of huge uh, range of possibilities opening up before us. But in the meantime, well, thank you very much, Deborah Sort of DSDHA, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day in your lovely studio. I better get thank to watering my plants. <laughs> See you later. See you later.